Hello everyone, um, my name is Jay Wang. I'm the director of the USC Center on Public Diplomacy. Welcome to our LinkedIn Live conversation. The topic for today is integrating AI in public diplomacy. And our guest is Alexander Hunt, public affairs officer in the US Embassy in Guinea. Uh, he was uh, one of the uh, early adopters of ChatGPT uh, using uh, the AI tool and to uh, summarize news stories. Uh, to free up time for field work and also to assess public sentiments. Uh, CPD recognized Alexander with the 2023 Ameri Prize for Innovation in Public Diplomacy. Uh, this annual prize recognizes US foreign and civil service officers for creative and scalable solutions that advance global public diplomacy. And the program was established by CPD in 2021 in partnership with the US Department of State to, pro to promote the practice of public diplomacy at a moment when public diplomacy is needed more than ever. Uh, so today our conversation uh, will focus on um, uh, Alexander's uh, use of uh, AI tools uh, in his work. And before we do that, uh, we're going to play a short video about his work in his own words. I joined the Foreign Service in 2017 after spending the first decade of my career um, mostly in the arts and culture sector. My assignment here at the U.S. Embassy in Guinea has been the most rewarding for me in many ways. It's really been a place where I feel like I have the space to experiment and take calculated risks. I first started experimenting with ChatGPT in December, uh, shortly after it was publicly released. At first, I wasn't quite sure how it could be helpful, but I quickly realized that I think the specific problem I would say that, that sparked my interest was the challenge of producing high quality written content in English for my non-native English speaking colleagues. I saw that ChatGPT could really be a tool that would help level the playing field and help us scale up content production and free up time for more strategic initiatives. For instance, our press and media specialist, who previously was spending hours uh, drafting our daily media summaries, is now able to have more meetings with journalists to learn about the threats to press freedoms uh, here in Guinea. And other team members that are using ChatGPT now have had more time for designing programming and conducting audience research and analysis and cable writing. So it's really allowed us to use our human brain for the analytical work that I think we were hired for. The Ameri Prize for Innovation in Public Diplomacy is an incredible recognition of the, the power of AI in our work. I think it serves as a reminder that uh, innovation and experimentation are, are really crucial to pushing the boundaries of what, what is possible in public diplomacy. I think AI is here to stay, but I do think that it has immense potential to support and enhance our work in public diplomacy. Welcome, Alexander, to our LinkedIn Live. And uh, um, to our audience, uh, please uh, submit your comments and uh, questions uh, during this entire period of time. And I'm going to start with a couple of questions. And so the video, uh, in the video, you talk a little bit about uh, how you used AI. Uh, just uh, wanted to hear a bit more about what you think are the benefits of using AI tools like this for a PD officer. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for having me. It's really an honor to be here. Um, I think that um, AI is is a way that we, we've been using AI really to supercharge our work in the public diplomacy section. Um, it's, it's helped us with not only with generative AI tools like large language models um, to help us in drafting uh, press guidance, speeches, um, our media summaries, but we've also been using AI tools um, with image and video generation to help with storytelling. Um, so I, I think that really AI has the power to uh, enhance the work of public diplomacy at embassies uh, around the world. And um, that's really something that the department is now uh, prioritizing, is integrating artificial intelligence tools into, into the work of public diplomacy. So there are um, lots of concerns, of course, about uh, these tools. Uh, what might be some of the drawbacks as you have sort of seen uh, in your work? 
Right. I'm like, I'm constantly uh, sort of simultaneously, mind, my mind is blown on, on the one hand, and at the same time, I'm terrified in a lot of ways because there, there are a lot of concerns. Um, I think the number one, especially for public diplomacy sections around the world, um, is the, the risk of misinformation and disinformation. Um, you know, this, there's sort of, this is the typical uh, dual use problem of new technology, right? It can be used for good or it can be used for ill. Um, and we've, we've already seen, um, unfortunately, in Guinea how these artificial intelligence tools have been used um, to create misinformation and, and disinformation. Um, so I think that's one of the biggest threats uh, that we are looking at, at, you know, that we need to face. And, um, you know, I think it's just something that we're going to have to be aware of and, and, and figure out how to mitigate. Mm. Can you give us an example of how you use, like, uh, like images, you know, uh, for storytelling uh, in public diplomacy work that you've been doing? S sure. So we've been using um, generative AI tools uh, like Leonardo and Runway. Uh, to generate graphics, for example, um, for when we when we are celebrating um, a national holiday, or we, we need to create some sort of branded materials um, for an event, for example, um, and we're also using um, these tools now for a storytelling project around um, an African prince from Guinea who, in the 18th century, was sold into slavery um, and eventually freed by uh, Secretary of State Henry Clay uh, and President Adams, and returned to to uh, the, con the African continent. So we're, we're sort of leveraging this story as a way to confront uh, this, this part of our past um, and, and the pain that comes along with it, but just confronting it head on. And we're using these generative AI tools to, um, to actually create an animated um, graphic novel that tells the story so we can reach uh, youth audiences. Well, that's really fascinating. I mean, so what are the challenges as you, you know, integrate AI into the workflow? Mm -hmm. So a lot of it, I think the, at the beginning, we, we were early, early adopters of these, tech, uh, these technologies. Um, I was playing with ChatGPT the day after it came out, basically. And within a few weeks, I was figuring out how to integrate it into our workflows. I think um, you know, the, the first challenge is just to get um, buy-in from your team and make sure that they sort of are, are on board with using these kinds of tools and they understand the, they understand, I guess, the, the limitations, you know, the, the risk of um, hallucinations, for example, uh, things like that. So we've we've done a lot of work to train our our team um, on on how to get the most out of these tools. Um, we've really trained them that the better the input, the better the output. You have to really work on prompt engineering, and then you always have to check the work that you're doing afterwards. So it's it's not like this is going to replace human uh, creativity and ingenuity. This is only going to enhance it. Mm. So how does this uh, integrating AI into the workflow, that strategy, uh, how does it look like in your overall strategy, I suppose, like you know, in, 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 in the workflow and uh, um, in designing communication approaches, uh, how does that sort of uh, right. fit into all of this? Uh, in planning. Right. So I work, I work with a team with two other Americans and nine local staff from Guinea. And, um, you know, everybody has different uh, levels of their, their writing skills are all at different levels. Um, you know, the, my, my uh, local staff colleagues are not native English speakers, for example. So um, I've actually encouraged them to use these large language models for anything that they're creating. Uh, as long as it's unclassified, we, we, we only use it for unclassified products. Um, so that uh, you know, it's almost like it can check check their work and make sure that the the, the quality of their work, um, you know, that there's there are fewer errors and uh, and things like that. So when when the local staff, for example, need to write a a speech for the ambassador, um, we we work with the local staff so that they can put in very very specific prompts um, into these large language models to to generate the best possible um, first draft, and then from there. The American officers can, you know, can add some more color and and uh, and things like that. But it's it's now basically a tool that everyone has open at their desk um, the minute they get into the office, and it's it's you know it really is integrated into everything that we do now. Mm. So we have a question from uh, our audience: uh, How and where can we learn about these tools uh, you are mentioning? Um, there are, <laughs> it's, it's actually overwhelming the number of tools that are available now. Um, and, you know, some require more technical expertise than others. Um, you know, Midjourney is a very popular one for creating uh, images, but it requires a little more, you know, t tech savviness. Um, 
over, over others. It just depends on the user interface that you're looking for. Um, we've been using not only ChatGPT in, in terms of large language models, but also Claude 2 uh, by a company Anthropic, which is a competitor to OpenAI, um, which has other sorts of, I mean, e each large language model sort of has its own benefits and has different, um, there's different use cases for each one. I mean, I, I really encourage people in the State Department and really everywhere to just get out and try. Um, you, can't, you can't break these tools. <laughs> you can't break anything by using them. Um, so I really think the best way to to sort of get started is to just um, start, you know, start using them. Mm -hmm. and, and as you mentioned that, you know, some of these tools are also not just only for creating stories, but also for uh, providing research analysis, right? That, right. Um, that you were just mentioning. Yeah, that's right. So um, one of the ways that we've been using the um, the paid version of ChatGPT is there's a an advanced data analysis uh, tool that's built in. Um, and recently, we conducted a public polling survey on our social media um, of about 1,500 Guineans, um, knowing that this was a very you know, specific subset of the population, obviously. But um, we then took the, the data and, and, and put the data set into ChatGPT and, were, uh, and using the advanced data analysis tool, we were able to engage with the data as if we were talking to a statistician who had, you know, who had internalized all of the data. And, um, you know, not only was it able to um, sort of identify unique trends, interesting trends in the data and determine whether they were statistically significant or not, but then it was able to go a step further and actually build uh, charts and graphs. For example, a heat map that shows um, uh, uh, approval ratings of different uh, political parties across ethnic groups um, and things like that, which then um, our political and economic team um, can use so that they can, uh, you know, to help them determine where to focus their efforts. So what are some of the limitations that you have seen in these tools? Yes, so, I mean, there, there are quite a few. Um, well, ChatGPT already is, you know, built on data up until 2021, and it's sort of, um, it, until recently, it was sort of hermetically sealed from having full access to the internet, but now there are plugins that allow you to access um, external sites when when you think it's appropriate. So you kind of have control, which I prefer. But I'd say the biggest limitations we're dealing with now are, is on the storytelling side and on the image and video creation because um, you don't have full control because you're basically handing over the creative aspects in a lot of ways to an AI that, that creates. And you can write really great prompts, but um, one of the things we've been struggling with in our storytelling is uh, character consistency. So we've, we create characters, um, you know the story of the enslaved prince that we're we're trying to create an animated um, we're trying to create this animated graphic novel uh, on on this story. Um, you know we've really struggled to keep the actual consistency of the look and feel of the characters so that you have that consistent throughout the storytelling. So that's something that we're trying to figure out how to work around. There are there are ways to to get there, but um, the technology, as mind blowing as it is, I mean, it's this is just the beginning. Um, as everyone knows, this is only the beginning, and it's only going to become, yeah, more advanced. So, what kind of level of resource, both in terms of you know uh, just investing you know in any of the tools and stuff like that, but also the human resources, uh, does it take? Let's use an example of that. You know, the the uh, you're telling the story about the prince. Uh, what what does it take to put all of them together? Well, we luckily we had already worked um, closely with an American author who wrote uh, a book in English about the this prince, and um, and several years ago we um, my my office had uh, turned that into a a, a French version a graphic novel. So it was a, a written graphic novel in black and white, um, and so now we're we're using all of those tools. Um, to, to bring it to life um, with these AI tools. Um, yeah, so we have something that's animated and that can be online, um, can reach a wider audience. Um, but uh, we're, this story is actually, it's a part of, you, you can actually ask ChatGPT about this prince and ChatGPT will give you the entire story. So mm -hmm. it's, um, it's, it is sort of common uh, knowledge in, in the region. Uh, or it's a, it's a story that's fairly well known in the region. So we've managed to sort of, we've had a good place to a starting point. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a question from our audience. Um, how can AI be used as a public diplomacy tool in times of conflict? That's interesting. I mean, we, we use um, generative AI tools 
um, to, to create, for example, press guidance around really sensitive topics. Um, and, <clears throat> or for example, if there's, um, if there's something, if there's an issue that um, is really important to the US Embassy, but that could um, have implications for the bilateral relationship, could negatively impact the bilateral relationship, um, Right now, there's um, you know there's a lot of concern in Guinea around threats to press freedoms, for example, and so we're we're able to actually use these generative AI tools to create, a, I guess, a more nuanced, uh, new, more nuanced messaging. Um, so the local staff has been using it, for example, for a lot of social media posts around these issues, um, and they're able to write prompts that help generate um, messages that are a little more sensitive, a little more nuanced. And sort of thread that needle uh, between, you know, not stepping on toes and, and making sure we uh, preserve our bilateral relationship while also, um, you know, expressing the position of the United States. Mm. And all of you know, the tools that you have used have um, have you experienced? Like we always talk about, AI tools have these biases, kind of built-in biases. Have you experienced that aspect of uh, uh, AI? Definitely. Um, I definitely have. When we're working with storytelling, for example, um, you know, it it tends to be biased towards, you know, it, it, it sort of ignores people of color a lot of times, or uh, you know, will make assumptions about gender and things like that. But I say on the flip side, we've actually found that um, it's it's been amazing in being able to help us with analytical um, work, and and actually removing a lot of the bias. So. Uh, in, in one example, we used um, the analytical as, uh, functions of ChatGPT, or and, excuse me, of Claude, of Claude 2 from Anthropic, to um, do a pre-screening of all of the um, grant uh, proposals that we received. Um, and in the past, this would have taken, you know, first of all, it would have taken dozens and dozens of, of staff hours, but the staff, you know, would also, in, in, a, lot, in a lot of instances, um, they would be looking at these proposals and saying, okay, well, some of these organizations we've already worked with, we know their work, we know the quality of their work. Um, and so, you know, what, so I think bias could creep in at times and we'd have to really check ourselves and make sure that, um, you know, that bias, we'd have to check our bias, right? Um, and we've noticed that, you know, that it's, it's pretty agnostic when it comes to these types of, uh, these types of things. So in a way, it's actually, actually um, you know, we've definitely seen bias in, in these tools, but then we've also seen how it can help eliminate bias. So you've been using bas basically off-the-shelf tools at this point. Um, would you want some like an in-house developer? Well, the or, <laughs> the, or is it necessary? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the department is exploring. The Department of State is actually exploring ways to develop uh, in-house large language models so that we can not only use it for unclassified, but use it for sensitive uh, material, for classified material, eventually. Um, I've been really impressed with how the Department of State has been bringing to life the Secretary of State's modernization agenda um, by really embracing this technology. They, there's a special envoy for emerging technologies now that um, I've been in, in communication with about these, about these issues. We actually have a visit from um, that office uh, that's coming to Guinea uh, in the first week of November to see how we're using artificial intelligence and, and sort of learn how it can be used um, within the department. And, and I do think that we will see in the coming year or, or two, um, you know, some tools, that proprietary tools that the department is, is creating. Yeah. And what are some of the policy sort of uh, guidances that you need to put in place, you know, for you to, uh, to do all of these programs using AI? Mm -hmm. Right, that's that's really important. Um, the department, like shortly after I reported on our work um, to the Department of State, um, the department put out some some interim guidance, a very brief, um, to just ensure that we're using AI responsibly. Um, the the guidance at at that, at that point was was just basically saying, you know, we should only use it for unclassified uh, materials, which we were already doing, luckily, in our office. Um, but since then, they have um, the department has developed an advisory council on on artificial intelligence that is uh, supposed to be putting out uh, additional guidance any any day now um, that will be a little more um, extensive because there's yeah there's there's issues also around um, 
um, property, intellectual property, uh, things things like that. So they're they're they've got now the lawyers involved, and you know it's, they've 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 really been working on getting um, more um, extensive guidance out to us. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the things that you're really excited about? You know, looking as you say that you know these technologies that continue to uh, uh, to improve, and uh, uh, what 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 excites you uh, in this area of work? I think what what I'm most excited about is that this these technologies can help us eliminate a lot of the drudgery of of our job. I mean, every job in the world has a drudgery aspect, right? So. I, I've just seen that it is, it is doing just that. It is eliminating a lot of the drudgery and allowing us to focus on actually engaging with the public, which is what we're there to do. Um, our press and media specialist has saved so much time using this tool that he was before he was spending you know, most of his day creating our daily media summaries. Now he's actually had the time to go out and speak to journalists and interview them and talk to the Ministry of Information and, and better understand what are the threats to press freedoms. And I, as a result, he actually wrote his first report. Uh, we call them cables, but he wrote his first report um, to, to, for, for DC to better understand what's going on in Guinea as it relates to, um, to pre threats to press freedoms. So to me, I think that's what I'm most excited about is that it's gonna actually allow us to do the work of diplomacy. Mm -hmm. And if you could say a little bit more about, you mentioned the, the modernization of diplomacy, uh, this whole initiative, how can AI uh, help to drive some of these innovations and uh, these creative uh, problem-solving uh, approaches uh, and for us to modernize public diplomacy enterprise? I mean, luckily, I've, I really do feel like I have the support of the State Department um, all, all the way up the chain, um, all the way up to the highest levels of leadership, um, including even the, the White House has talked a lot about how artificial intelligence, we should be leveraging these tools um, to better the work that we do as public servants. Um, but um, in, specifically in, in public diplomacy, um, there's a new initiative uh, that, that the Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy put out uh, called AI for PD. And it's basically, um, it's basically just that, to figure out how we can use these tools um, to enhance our work. Um, and it's, it's been really uh, encouraging to see mm -hmm. how, how um, yeah, open they are to, mm -hmm. to using these tools. Mm -hmm. So you've been doing this uh, you know, at the US Embassy in Guinea. Um, can you see yourself doing the same things at a different embassy? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> as long as I have a, as long as I have you know an ambassador in a front office that says open open to us using these tools. I mean, I've also been lucky that the, in in Guinea, I'm in an assignment where, you know, I'm I'm really given the space to be creative and um, and to take smart risks. Um, and I've had the support of the ambassador there uh, in the front office. They've been incredibly um, open to it, all of the, the you know, crazy things that I've wanted to do. So I, I hope to take it with me um, throughout my career. And I honestly think that as time goes on, it's, it's going to become as, as integrated into everything we do as, as spell check is now. So, so I think it'll become easier and easier to, to get by in. So on a resource question, because we always know that PD, you know, uh, is, is, is always kind of a short on resources. In this particular case, um, does it require extra resources to do all of the things that you've been doing? Or, uh, you know, uh, given the current level of resource that uh, you're able to, uh, you know, execute uh, yeah. these uh, programs? So in a lot of posts in, in Africa, um, we, we struggle with a lack of resources. We have a hard time attracting diplomats to, to come work at, at these posts. Um, we don't have the, the financial resources necessarily that we could really benefit from. And um, so, yeah, it, it, these, you know, these tools cost money and some of them cost more, some of them cost less. But we found that it's been able to basically replace, you know, or enhance the work in such a way that we can get by with less human resources, if that, if that makes sense. Um, that's not to say that I think we should not continue to uh, you know, attract. We need, still need talent um, at these posts overseas, in, in, especially on the African continent. Um, but yeah, there's an, it's an investment that it pays, off in, pays off in dividends, so. Yeah. Uh, can you say a little bit more about um, how like humans collaborate with AI as opposed to you know, AI replacing mm -hmm. um, the, the work that we do, and at least um, in what you have been doing, how the, how you know how have you or your staff uh, so collaborated with AI 
you know, to pull out uh, these communications. Yeah, I mean, I think a, a simple example is um, on the translations, mm -hmm. on translations. So, you know, Deepl and Google Translate are really great tools, but you can't really dive into the nuances of some of the some of the words, for example, or some of the expressions. And that's something that I've seen that my local staff has been able to do to engage with AI and and you know, let's say, translate a speech, for example, and then and, and then have queries against um, these large language models and say, okay, how would this um, expression you know be perceived from this kind of audience or um, is there another way that I could say this that would be less direct or less, less you know, that would be less controversial? Um, so that's been one way that I've seen that, that, that my team has been using it. They've actually thought of it basically as a thought partner in a lot of ways for things like translation. Um, also, when we write our speeches for the ambassador, we want to make sure that you know, he's, he's comfortable as a non-native French speaker um, with, with, with the speech. And so we can actually work with the AI to say, okay, you know, write this speech so that it actually is using a lot of English language cognates as when, where possible, things like that. Um, so, I mean, that's just one example, but um, really in all of the work that we do now, I've, I see my team and I do the same, basically engaging, it's a back and forth conversation that we're having with, with these tools. Mm -hmm. Any suggestions for, you know, for us uh, in terms of uh, developing these prompts, right? So I think, uh, you know, th that's really critical yeah. <laughs> uh, to, help, uh, to make AI really helpful for you. Uh, so any advice and suggestions on how you develop these prompts? Yeah, I, right. I think I think prompt engineering. I mean, writ large is going to become. I mean, there may be a class here at USC one day on prompt engineering. Who knows? But I think that's really going to become um, a, a really important skill uh, in the workplace. I mean, and for us, it already is. Um, and that's something that I have to train my team on um, over and over. Have to. It's a it's a process. We 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 do a lot of um, training uh, regularly on this. But prompt engineering, um, I think what's really important is to provide as much context as possible. Um, so, you know, about the tone, the, the content, the length, the style, you know, it, you really have to provide a lot of contact, context and, you know, the, so that you can get the best output. So the, the better the input, the better the output. That's what I keep trying to drive home to my team. Um, so when you know when they write prompts, we we look at them together and say, okay, how could you have written this differently to get a better better outcome? Um, you know, one example is we wrote a, a speech for the ambassador for International Women's Day, and um, you know the team had written a prompt or something and had given me a draft, and it was just extremely generic, right? So I worked with them and said, okay, let's see how we can adapt this prompt and and get better results and. We included things like, okay, we, we want examples of Guinean women in, you know, who have you know, advanced women's rights in, in Guinea, um, and, ma and make sure you don't include one quote from an American uh, female figure, historical figure. Um, and, and that helped sort of add color to, to the final product that you know, they wouldn't have gotten had they not um, sort of uh, worked on these prompts. Are there organizations that you kind of also kind of not look up, look up to, but you, you check their work in terms of how they are using AI that may be helpful uh, as you think about your own strategies. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I've, been, I've been working with several organizations who've got wind of what we've been doing. Um, uh, one is called the Center for Digital, I'm, I cannot remember the name uh, right now, um, unfortunately, but, um, but I actually, yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I'd, I'd be curious what other, um, yeah, I don't know if any of the listeners might have suggestions, but it's such a new field that I feel like we're, you know, we're still trying to, to figure out who the players are and, um, yeah, and who the exper experts are. Mm -hmm. um, any advice uh, for us in academia, you know, uh, as we are developing uh, new talents in communications field, uh, given how the field is changing uh, with AI technology, uh, any advice for us like the curriculum in terms of things that our students need to uh, develop when they are here in school. Right. I mean, I think that artificial intelligence, these tools, are, generative AI tools are here to stay um, and they're only going to become more integrated into our lives. And so I don't think there's any way to push back against them. Um, so I think maybe um, it would be helpful for students to learn how to wield these tools uh, to their benefit. And, um, and I, I already have spoken to some of the faculty here and it sounds like they're already doing just that. They're finding ways to integrate these tools into their um, into their curricula. So I'd, I'd say that's, that would be my biggest uh, advice, yeah. 
Well, thank you so much. Thank um, you. This is really helpful. <laughs> and uh, um, I'm sure we'll continue this conversation and this uh, discussion on how we can uh, leverage AI uh, for our public diplomacy strategies and work. So thanks to our audience uh, for joining us. And uh, by the way, uh, the Stentown Public Diplomacy is uh, offering a training workshop on integrating AI in public diplomacy. And the workshop is going to take place in Washington, D.C. at USC's uh, Capitol Campus um, on November the 13th uh, to the 14th. It's a two-day workshop. And please check, check out uh, the information about the workshop on our website, uh, uscpublicdiplomacy.org. And uh, we look forward to uh, continue uh, working with you and uh, um, discussing with you um, AI uh, for public diplomacy. Thank you. Uh, see you next time. Thank you.